So um, let's kick off. My name is Gerprit Singh and I'm delighted to have you join us today. A little bit around the sort of um, agenda that we've got today. So I'm going to do a quick introduction, uh, give you an idea of what's coming and um, introduce you to ethical reading a little bit. Then I'm going to hand over to um, Alex, um, who's going to talk um, about uh, responsible business today. We'll have a bit of time for Q&A. Unfortunately, Alex does have to get away at 9.45 sharp because he's got another session that he's attending. Um, but then we'll wrap up um, after that and um, should, uh, should be a, a fascinating session. So what is ethical reading? I think most of you uh, being partners or supporters will know um, essentially who we are, but there are some guests, so I'm going to quickly run through it. Um, we're a fairly new not-for-profit social enterprise, been going a couple of years, um, and our mission really is to embed ethics into the way we live and work uh, in Reading. Um, it is primarily around the workplace, um, but also actually to, to engage with the general public because most people work somewhere uh, as well. We want to inspire people um, through sessions like this, through brilliant um, uh, speakers like Alex. We want to educate um, and we do believe this is a bit of a muscle, you know, you can get better at it through uh, learning more. Uh, and we want to encourage collaboration. That's one of our key aims. It's also one of our key values. Um, we continue to grow. We got, we're at about 45 partners and supporters after a couple of years, and we're over about 3,000 individual members and followers. So I think that shows there is an appetite, um, and particularly in the younger generation as well. We are run entirely by volunteers, and we hope that Reading is really the start of something much bigger. We hope it's the start of a, a global ethical cities movement, and we do have interest from around the world. And as you've seen, Bev uh, is one of our mentors um, based in Omaha in the US, and, and we hope that actually, um, you know, working with them, we can kickstart this um, both in the US, but also globally. I did want to give a quick uh, shout out to something that we're doing on July the 9th. So if you have some time, um, then please do join us. Uh, we've got a session there where we've got some um, leading um, uh, business um, 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 CEOs. Uh, and uh, what we're talking about there is really how do we create a new normal? There's an awful lot of research out there, an awful lot of information which shows that actually people don't go, want to go back to the same old, same old after the pandemic. As we come out of this, um, and by, we're no, by no means out of the woods yet, but as we come out of this um, situation, um, which has taken a heavy toll, um, we, we really want to, um, and a lot of people want to capitalise on that opportunity to create a new normal, a new environment, which is more equitable, which is fairer, um, in you know, workplaces are more ethical. Um, it's a vibrant environment where people want to turn up on a Monday morning, they want to engage, they want to work with their colleagues. And there's an awful lot of research actually out there which shows that if you have um, a workplace like that, it actually improves people's well-being. You know, people sleep better, they live longer, they're more at ease, and because they're more at ease, um, they're actually more creative as well. So if we, you know, if you can create a culture like that, um, then you do actually end up with higher performance because you can have something like, um, you know, uh, 20, 30 percent improvement in performance down to the fact that you have more engaged people. Um, so how do you create that environment? So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, on the 9th, we will have um, Paul Hargreaves, who's the CEO of Cotswold Fair. Um, we'll have um, Shen um, Burstecher from AND Digital. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. But if you're, if you're in, in the audience, Shen, um, really, really uh, apologize for that. Um, but she is a fantastic lady. And AND Digital have a very interesting way of organizing people. Um, so that'll be, uh, you know, tremendous insight. We'll have uh, Rachel Eden, who's our new deputy mayor uh, as well. So, you know, it's going to be a fantastic session. The second half, we're going to have uh, mini breakouts, uh, mini um, sessions by some of our service providers. And one of the things that, you know, we've been asked is, well, you know, ethical rating, that's great. You, you, you give a good talk, but how do you put it into practice? 
And um, the services launch with the second half on the 9th is precisely around that. How do you put some of these things into practice inside organizations? How do you create a vibrant culture? How do you improve your well-being? So actually your best position to really um, for that exceptional performance inside your team or inside your organization. So we hope you can join us for that. That would be fabulous. That's on the 9th of July. So I'm delighted to welcome um, Alex uh, as our speaker today. So Alex is, uh, is an economist. He's a professor of finance at the London Business School. He has a degree from Oxford, a PhD from MIT. He's taught at the Wharton Business School um, before moving to, to the London Business School. And in between that, he, uh, he's also worked at Morgan Stanley in investment banking. Um, what I particularly liked going through uh, the background, and Alex actually is he's not only a great economist, but he's also a great teacher. So he's not only a great specialist, he can get the message across, which is fabulous. So he got 14 teaching awards in six years. That's brilliant. So, um, and actually that comes across, particularly if you look at his TED Talks, which are brilliant as well. So please do that. Um, one final thing is actually that um, his latest book, Grow the Pie, uh, we're going to have a special discount code for that at the end, uh, is top of the list for the Financial Times and Management Books of the Year so far. So well done on that, Alex. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to him. So I'm going to stop sharing. And if you can share your screen, Alex. Great. Well, well, thank you so much, Gerprit. And thank you to everybody who's come and participated. I've done loads of webinars on the lockdown. Never before has somebody gone up at 3 a.m. in the morning to, to watch mine. So I'm really flattered for that. And also, while I've done lots of webinars, this one I'm really interested in because I'm actually from Reading. So I think when Jill contacted me um, all those months ago, she might not have, had, she might not have known this, but I, I grew up um, close to all, next to Aldrington School in early. I went to Aldrington when I was young, um, then Dolphin School in her. I used to work as a paperboy for the Reading Standard, which is now defunct. I had a column in the Reading Chronicle. It was called Pundit's Panel, where I won this uh, competition where um, the Reading Chronicle had people who were predicting Reading Football Club's results. So I was a season ticket holder at Elm Park, then at the Medeski Stadium. I ran the Reading Half Marathon many years. So um, this is a, 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 a town that I I'm really, really um, have a lot of affinity from, with still. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to uh, share with you responsible business in particular how it relates to the coronavirus crisis but i'm also going to talk about responsibility in general and before i talk you through my ideas i'm going to start with a story now um we've been locked down in the uk for about three months uh, but let me take you at least metaphorically halfway around the world i'm going to take you to the great rift valley so this stretches across two continents, from Lebanon and Asia to Mozambique and Africa. It has some of the world's highest mountains, and it also has some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, which is on the southernmost tip of the Great Rift Valley. Now you might think it's hard for you to imagine that you're here because you haven't seen it before, but actually some of you might have seen it before, at least in a movie. <laughs> And that movie is called The Constant Gardener, based on a John Le Carré novel of the same name. And indeed, maybe millions of the world, people in the world have seen this movie and therefore seen the lake, but fewer than a thousand people call the lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes a living sharing and herd, um, herding and rearing goats. Now, it used to be for Emmanuel that cash was king. So it was cash that he would receive if he sold a goat. He'd then have to check that cash in case it was forged. He'd have to store that cash and risk getting robbed. And then to bank the cash, he needed to trek to the nearest bank, which wasn't on Friar Street. It was one whole day away. So his life was really tough and he couldn't grace his goat on the greenest pastures Right, he had to live within one day's walk of a bank. But all of that changed because of the topic of today, which is a responsible business, and that is Vodafone. Now, as some of you might know, Vodafone in 2007 launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. 
Now, let me briefly explain what mobile money is because people think it's uh, mobile banking. So uh, mobile banking is I've got a bank account and I can operate it on my phone rather than having tra to track to a branch. But actually, with mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that's really important, right, because many people in Kenya didn't have access to the banking network. And so this has transformed Emmanuel's life. Well, he no longer needs to deal with cash. He doesn't need to worry about counterfeit money. He doesn't need to worry about something being forged. And he can graze his goats where he wants to. He doesn't need to be within one day of a bank. And also other things benefited. Right? His accounting system was easy because on his phone he had a record of transactions and so he knew how much money he was getting in and how much he was paying in. Now we don't want to form a conclusion based on just one study, but in general there was evidence that within seven years of starting Mpesa, 200,000 households in Kenya got lifted out of poverty and many of those households were headed up by women because it allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail. So this had a huge knock-on effect in terms of gender equality. So that's one study of Vodafone. But let me tell you another story, which is quite different, but also about ethical capitalism. And this is about ethical tax. So in 2012, Vodafone became the first company in the telecoms industry around the world to release a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to governments worldwide. And that's really important in the telecoms industry because you could choose to locate your licenses in low tax regimes. So I've got a question. Actually, I've got two questions for everybody on this webinar. The first is which of these decisions created most value for society? And the second is which of these decisions, if you had not taken them, would have led to the most public outrage or worse than Vodafone's corporate social responsibility rating or reputation? Now, I'm not going to poll anybody here because I'm pretty sure that most people here would agree with the answers. So which decision created most value for society? It was the first one. By launching Mpesa, um, Vodafone helped lift 200,000 households out of poverty, and this got expanded to many other countries also. But what would have been the backlash had you not launched Mpesa? Nothing. Right, the media doesn't slam you for not making an innovation, because they may not have even thought that this crazy idea of launching banking without a bank was not possible to begin with. So they may not have just known that this was something that you could have done. But what would have been the outrage were you not transparent on tax? That would have been massive. You would have been slammed. And indeed, many people here might remember what happened two years previously to Vodafone. UK Uncut, which was a citizens group, reported in 2010 that Vodafone avoided, legally, but maybe not ethically, £6 billion of tax. And just at the same time, it just so happened that George Osborne, the Chancellor, unveiled £6 billion of austerity. So you can imagine the headlines. Well, you, the taxpayer, you are suffering austerity because this unethical company is avoiding tax. And what is the backlash of that? It is um, stuff like boycotts, what right? the public is um, unhappy, quite understandably, about companies that are not ethical about tax. So where does this leave us, right? So don't get me wrong, fair taxes and fair wages and not polluting the environment are absolutely important. They are part of ethical capitalism. But you already knew this before coming on this webinar. So all the things that Gerp mentioned, I completely agree with those. A lot of the other events that you are doing at, at Ethical Reading are to try to encourage that behavior, fairness in terms of the distribution of the profits of the company. So instead, because I'm sure you already know that, I wanted to give a different view on responsibility and ethicality. It's that, yes, you must be fair with taxes and wages and so on, but that's not enough. So what I'm saying is that an ethical company is not about do no harm. 
It's more than that. It's actively do good. So I think it's unethical if you're a large company with Vodafone with some great technology not to think about how can we use it not only within the UK and the US in the form of normal telephony, but how can we use this in Africa to solve the problem of financial inclusion? And that second definition of ethicality, it's often actually um, not emphasized enough because we often think that ethicality is splitting a pie fairly rather than actively innovating to grow the pie. And so that's the framework that I'm going to provide here um, for the rest of the talk. And while I did have until 9.35, I'm going to try to end early because I want to have a lot of time for, for questions and discussion. And if there's not, if there's questions that you have at the end, which we don't get time to, please drop me a note on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any question that, that I get. But here's the framework. We often think that the value that a company produces is given by a pie. And we think that ethicality is ensuring a fair split of the pie. That pie can be given to investors in the form of profits, or it can go to society in the form of taxes to the government, wages to workers, fair prices to customers, and fair prices to suppliers, and so forth. And we often think that ethicality is about splitting the pie fairly, so it might be that we accept a smaller share of the pie. So going back to the crisis, we've had executives like the CEO of Boeing and United take no pay. We've seen Unilever um, give 100 million euros of food and sanitizer. And again, that is absolutely part of ethicality, but you knew that before I came on this webinar, before you woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning to come here. So what I'm about is a different view and why I think this idea of ethicality is just about pie splitting is limited for two reasons. So the first is that, well, if indeed ethicality is about reducing profits, well, then that's bad for the company in the long term. And it might mean that many companies might not want to voluntarily practice ethicality. So one thing that Gerbert mentioned, sort of the, the $64,000 question, putting it into practice, right, that's something which is a big barrier. You might get some CEOs signing the business roundtable statement saying they care about society, but not actually doing anything about it. And if indeed you think that practicing ethicality means less profit, right, you might indeed do the minimum possible. And the second reason why viewing ethicality as splitting the pie differently is limited is that it's bad for investors. Now, you might think, well, we don't care about that, right? Because we like to think that investors are nameless, faceless capitalists. They're like hedge funds and so on. Investors are them and society is us. So if we can take from them and give to us, that's better for society. But in fact, investors are not them. They are us. They involve a pension fund saving for our retirement, parents saving for their children's education. They include insurance companies making sure that they can fund future claims. So what I believe is that any repurposing of capitalism, it absolutely needs to take society the orange seriously, but it also must deliver value to long-term investors, which is the blue. And so that's why the title of, of the book that um, Gilfred mentioned is grow the pie. So it says ethicality is about moving from here, not to here, but to here, to create more value for society, for both stakeholders and investors. And you do that through some crazy daring innovations like Vodafone's idea of banking without a bank. So absolutely, it shares with the pie splitting mentality. We want to increase the orange, but we do that not by giving society a greater share of what's already there. It's not just making corporate philanthropy donations. It's about actually innovating. And even though the innovation of m -Pesa was genuinely introduced to try to create value for society, as a byproduct, investors were ultimately able to benefit because they were to monetize it. And many employees may have joined Vodafone because they're excited to work for a purposeful firm. So to end the first part of the talk before I get to some evidence, um, what I'm talking about in the book, you can love or hate the phrase, I've called it pie economics, but regardless of whether you like or dislike the word, what is it about? It's about ethicality being seeking to create profits 
only through creating value for society. And let me pick apart this definition a little bit. Right before you came on this webinar, you knew the bottom line, the last four words, we want to create value for, for society. But what I'm adding to this is that you want to do this in profitable ways. You want to seek create profits through creating value for society, right? Just giving a massive corporate donation, just writing a check, that doesn't necessarily create profits. And also the important word is only. Right, the other way to create profits is to start from, say, here, and then let's price gouge customers to move to here. And say Valiant Pharmaceuticals in the US, they bought other pharmaceuticals firms and hiked the prices. But we're saying, yeah, profits are important. We want to serve investors, but we only do that through solving social problems. Now, at this point, you might have some mixed emotions. You might think, okay, what Alex says is, is, is great, it sounds inspiring, but where's the evidence for that? It's just a bit too good to be true. But what I'm saying is that just think about serving society and then you'll ultimately benefit magically your profits are going to go up. So this is why uh, most of what I do as a business school professor is to look at the evidence. Right? Ethical capitalism is inherently a practitioner question. So all of you, you know much more about companies than me. You're much closer to the actual action. Uh, I, as a professor, I'm a bit disconnected. But actually what this dis disconnection gives is it gives me time and space to study not just one company, but hundreds of companies to separate out correlation from causation and to see whether this actually holds true in the data. And so that's what a lot of my work is doing. Let me just um, skip a, a couple of slides here. This is just on the importance of rigorous data. Um, uh, I mentioned my TED talk, which said, we need to be careful about believing things we'd like to be true. Uh, people would like to believe that ethical companies would perform better, so we can't just accept that because it sounds nice. Instead, let's look at rigorous evidence. And that's what I uh, tried to do. So in one of my own papers, this is when I was doing my PhD at MIT, I tried to look at the link between ethicality and a company's long-term performance. Now, one of the challenges here is, well, how do we measure ethicality, right? We can't look at the business whether you sign a statement because signing a statement means nothing. We can't look at a company's purpose statement. They could have a great statement but not put it into practice. So instead, well, what was my data source? Well, what I looked at was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. So that was a data source on how well you treat your employees. Now, employees are not the only element of ethicality. Right? There's taxpayers, there's the environment, and so forth. But I chose to focus on employees because I had a really good measure available. So why was this data set so good? Well, at first, it was really thorough. So some people will look at how well you treat your employees by looking at something like board diversity. And obviously, diversity is really important, but you could be a company that doesn't care at all about diversity but you just put a token minority on the board to tick a box. So what this does is it surveys employees, 250 workers at all levels, and asks them questions not just on quantitative factors like pay and benefits, but also qualitative factors like trust and management, pride in your job, and camaraderie with your colleagues. Now, the second reason why this data set is really good is it was available from 1984. So this ethical movement is, is new. So as Gerfried mentioned, ethical reading has only been going for a couple of years. And if indeed most data sources are only available for a couple of years, that's problematic, right? Because the last few years, at least before the pandemic, were really boom years. So if I show that there was a relationship in the 2010s, many people would say, well, ethicality pays off, but only in an economic boom, right? If there's a downturn, like right now in a pandemic, maybe ethicality is a luxury, maybe we need to watch every penny. So what I had here is 28 years of data from 1984 to 2011, which included things like the financial crisis, like the collapse of the dot-com bubble, to make sure that it wasn't just due to a couple of years that were a flash in the pan.
So what I wanted to do was to um, show that the companies that were the best companies to work for also delivered higher returns to shareholders. They weren't just fluffy companies that were distracted from the bottom line. Now, there's a lot of challenges. Is it correlation or causation, right? Do happy employees cause the company to perform better? Or is it only once the company is performing better that it causes workers to be happy or it's able to spend money on gyms and so forth? Now, all of that is in the, the paper um, so, and, 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 and in the book. I was told to make sure that Bev stays awake, so I'm not going to go through all the statistical rigor that I'm using to show causality. Instead, I'm going to get to the bottom line which is that I found that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered stock returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period. So that's 89 to 184% cumulative, and that's substantial. And I think this fundamentally changes the way that we think about our work what you view workers as a cost to be minimized, as human resources, not as human resources. We want to pay them as little as possible and work them as hard as possible. And, and, and that, you might think, is a caricature, but indeed, why might Sports Direct and BHS treat their workers in such a way they believe it's the best way to short-term profit? But what the evidence suggests is by treating workers ethically, you're not donating pie to them, but you're growing the pie because then they become more productive and more motivated and so forth. So let me get to the, the final three sections, which will all be quick. I'm going to talk about what this means for practitioners. Okay, this was a study. It's given us evidence. What does that evidence mean? So I think I, it means uh, two things for practitioners. I'm going to start with companies. Right, so often people think about ethicality as CSR, as corporate social responsibility. Now, I haven't used that term today. Why? Because CSR often has the connotation of something that is non-core, which you can just delegate to a CSR department. Right? It could be that the company produces tobacco. It has a great CSR department, which um, does some corporate philanthropy. But what I'm saying is responsible business is mainstream. It is a CEO-level issue. Right, because if you're ethical and you're treating your workers fairly, there's other studies for the environment and so forth. This actually boosts long-term profitability. It's not an optional extra. So often when I speak to audiences, people introduce me as a professor of finance. And the audience does a double take. They think they've misheard. Right, because the finance department of a company is often the enemy of responsible business. But what the evidence suggests is that any finance department with that mindset is not doing their job, at least not in the long term. And the second implication is for investors, because it's often investors who call the shots in companies and investors have votes and directors. And uh, when I went to my first conference on ethical investing back in 2007, the investors at those, that conference were not the mainstream investors that you would have heard of. They were, if I was to mention the names, you would have probably not heard of them. So it was often viewed that ethicality was a non-financial factor, and you should only take this into account if you were a socially responsible investor whose goals were not just to make money, but they were also to combat climate change or to um, promote gender diversity. But what this evidence suggests is that these seemingly non-financial factors are actually financial factors in the long term, right? So even if you're an investor and your only goal is to make as much money as possible, which is a fine goal, right? If you're a pension fund, you need to make sure that retirees have money. You should still consider these factors. And sort of why I have to duck off a little bit before 10 is the next webinar I'm giving is to Fidelity, right? They're a mainstream investor. They've kindly bought the book to give to their global investment team and to think about how to integrate this into a strategy. And this makes me really happy. Why? Because it means that even mainstream investors who only look at long-term profitability realize that these aspects are fundamental. Two more things before I open up to questions. The next is, well, how do we put it into practice? Yes, yeah, so I've said it's important. CEOs, investors should care about it. 
But let me now get to the elephant in the room. And the elephant into the room, at least one of them, is, well, how do we make decisions if we are going to have ethicality as the bottom line, not shareholder value? And why is that important? Well, managers know how to make decisions when they are pursuing shareholder value. What they do is they do what finance professors like me teach years you do a you calculate the impact of shareholder value and if it's positive you take the investment if it's negative you reject it but if we don't have shareholder value as the bottom line well how do we make decisions right it can't be a free for all we still need to know well how are we going to decide what investments to take and what to turn down so in the book i have three principles where i discuss um this i'm only going to go through one because i want to end early to make sure there's time for questions and that is the principle of materiality now before i get into this let me explain what i mean by um purpose right because purpose has been a subtext to my talk but i've not defined it now often we think that purposeful means altruistic right a purposeful company is one that uh, serves society. But actually, that's not what the word purposeful means. Purposeful means targeted and focused. So a purposeful meeting is one with an agenda. If I do something on purpose, I do it deliberately. So what this means is that a purposeful company also is a targeted and focused one. You couldn't have your purpose, as in the first red bullet, to serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment, and communities, and investors, right? you can't be all things to all people. Sometimes you're going to have tough decisions where you're going to satisfy some but not others. So let's take the French energy company, Engie. Right? They had a difficult decision. Do we shut down this power plant in Australia, which is the most polluting plant in the OECD? If we do that, we're going to help the environment, but we're going to hurt workers. And so if your purpose is to serve workers and the environment, it's not clear how to do that. So that's why the concept of materiality comes in. Right? This says, yes, we do care about all these stakeholders, but there are some which are first among equals. And materiality is who are the most important stakeholders for your business. So that's why I would define purpose as the answer to the question, how is the world a better place by your company being here? And the answer to that has to be narrow. It has to be focused, just like a citizen's purpose can't be to be a doctor and a teacher and a lawyer and a banker and entrepreneur. You, you'd be one of them. So this takes me to the, the final um, slide in terms of the, uh, the evidence before I get onto the pandemic. So what this is, some of you will be familiar, is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board materiality map. So what they do is they go through each industry and they say, well, who are the most material stakeholders for your business? So if I take the left column, mining, right? So the environment is material because if there's a flood, you can't operate your mine. But if you're in a financial services bank, it doesn't affect you so much. What matters much more is social capital. So customer privacy, data security, selling practices, if you violate one of those dimensions, you're going to be in more trouble. And so what a study by some professors at Harvard showed is if you take MSCI ESG, which is the most popular data set for ESG factors, and if you take companies that do well on everything, they do well across the board, they don't actually beat the market. They only beat it by 1.5% per year, and that's insignificant. But if you take companies that do well on the material dimensions and scale back on the immaterial ones, you do beat the market by 4.8% per year. And I think that's striking because what it suggests is that it's better to do well on only a few things than to do well on everything. Because if you're doing well on everything, you're not discerning, you might just be forgetting about shareholders. It's just like if somebody was to say, I serve on 20 non-profit boards, you might think he or she has a time management problem, right? It's better to serve on three than 20, right? We know that. I see Bev smiling because of this. Yeah, we know that for a person, but for a company, 
we hope we, we expect companies to solve all of the world's problems when in fact well maybe there's certain things that you will move the needle on maybe it's financial inclusion in Kenya so that gets me to my final section which is well how do we think about this in the crisis well in this crisis we've seen some amazing corporate responses and many of them are what I call pie splitting you're voluntarily giving up part of the pie to help others. As I said, it was the CEOs of United and um, Boeing which were taking zero pay. Some of them are paying their workers. So win resorts in the US, but they're continuing to pay all their workers even though their hotels are shut. And they're helping customers, Unilever giving 100 million euros to a food and sanitizer to communities. But why I started this talk with the importance of pie growing is that not everybody can split the pie. Well, not every company has 100 million euros lying around. And what if you're not in the food and sanitizer industry and you don't have something to give? So that's why I think we need to look at responsibility as also about pie growing, about innovation rather than just donating money. And so the question that I have is that any leader should ask herself, what is in my hat? So what resources does my company have and how can I think creatively about redeploying them to serve wider society? And, and this, I think, will just lead to some, some great innovations. So it means, well, if you're a company in an unrelated industry, you can help. So let's take Chelsea Football Club. Right? They don't clearly have anything to give in the crisis, <coughs> but actually they do. Right? What's in their hand is a hotel and they're using that hotel to house NHS doctors and nurses. And that could also apply to, say, Ford in the US, right? Rather than making airbags, they're using the airbag material to make masks. It could apply to LVMH, the perfume company. They're pivoting from perfume to sanitizer. And they need all of these things are great innovations. And had you not thought of the crazy idea to maybe pivot, there might not have been a media backlash. But I don't think ethicality is about using what is in your hand and thinking outside of the box, how can I redeploy this to help society? It also applies to large companies hit by the crisis. So let's think of Qantas Airways in the US. Well, they would love to keep paying their workers, but they just can't. Their business has been hit, they've got no money. But what is in their hand is a business relationship, and that is with Woolworths. Now, don't think about the Woolworths, which was in Broad Street, Reading. Right? Woolworths in Australia is a grocery store. And that relationship is such that if you go to Woolworths and you buy groceries, you can get some air miles. But they've leveraged that relationship in order to say that if you're an employee and you're furloughed from Qantas, we're going to redeploy you to Woolworths so you can still keep um, a, a job and an income and a purpose in life. The final example is on a small company. So let me use a small company I'm a customer of. This is a company called Barry's Boot Camp. It is a brutal gym in London. So some of the clients are people like Jamie Carragher and David Beckham, or at the other end of the fitness spectrum, you have George Osborne and so on. But sort of they are obviously closed down right at the moment because of the um, social distancing. But what can they do to help out? Well, one thing is they're offering online um, fitness sessions, uh, which are really for free which is really important because people are self-isolating. But you might think, well, that's not really innovative, like a gym offering fitness classes. But here's the great thing. So let's say you are a desk worker in the gym. You serve on the reception. But how can you help out in this crisis? Right? You've got nothing that to give. But what it turns out is that some of these desk workers are actors as their main job. And they're just taking this desk job because acting is, is volatile in terms of the income. Now, if you're an actor, what is in your hand? Well, you're really funny. Well, now how does that help in a crisis? Well, we have a lot of working parents with their children at home because the schools are shut. So what they have is a program where these desk staff will read stories to children via Zoom or entertain them in other ways, and that's really valuable to take the load off a working parents. And again, I think that's just a great example, even though at a small scale, just to use what is in your hand to serve wider society. I guess I'm just going to open it up to, to questions now, but as, as was mentioned um, by Gerprud, I've just written this book, um, Grow the Pie, on how 
great companies deliver both purpose and the person that book. And so I think historically people think about purpose and ethics as an optional extra. You do it to avoid a media backlash. You might do it now if there's sort of Extinction Rebellion or Black Lives Matter movement, you do it reactively. But what I'm saying is there's a business case for being proactive about it. And it's not just about good for society, it's good for a company's long-term sustainable value. So you might be the most hard-hearted, sort of hard-headed, sorry, CEO. But even you should perhaps um, take this into account. And it also puts a framework to navigating these difficult decisions, such as um, what investments to take and what to turn down. So it's available on, on places like Amazon. But actually, um, Ethical Reading uh, also um, launched this, um, this uh, discount code with, uh, with Cambridge. So you buy it directly from the publisher. I think Amazon, anyway, is, giving, is showing a 25% discount. But this is, I think it might be sold out on Amazon at the moment. So here's another option. But thank you so much for the attention. Uh, I've ended a little bit early, so let me uh, open up to, to, to questions. And shall I hand back to you? Um, go for it. That's great. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, super session. Um, yeah, uh, Brad, perhaps you um, have you got a, a thought? I know you've been thinking uh, around these topics for a while. Have you got a question or two for Alex to kick off the, the, the Q&A? Well, I do. Uh, can, have I, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Okay. So I did prepare a question, um, actually. And uh, in fact, in, I have to say, Alex, it's the most important question about your book. So I, I, I liked very, very many things in the book, but I, I have this one worry and, and here, it, here it is. Your book makes a very persuasive case for enterprises, both identifying their social purpose and keeping this purpose clearly in mind when making decisions about what activities to initiate, expand, contract, get out of, etc. And the book advocates the selection of social purpose be made not only by the leaders of the enterprise, but also with contributions from other stakeholders. But now here's the question. But isn't giving so many different people and groups a voice in such a decision likely to produce fundamental disagreement between them or vagueness about the purpose or mission creep? And are there ways to mitigate such problems about the collaborative identification of the enterprise's social purpose? I think this is a great challenge, Brad. So, so, so um, th the, the question that Brad is asking is, is linked to one of the topics in the book is sort of who gets to decide what the company's purpose is. And, and typically we think it's sort of a CEO, she thinks about purpose and then people just implement it. Uh, but what I try to emphasize is that purpose needs to be something collaborative. So you involve your employees, you involve your customers and external stakeholders. But as Brad rightly points out, that could lead to purpose being vague as you've got too many cooks, right? Then you don't actually know what the purpose is. And so that's why I, am, I, I think that, like with many of these things, there is obviously a balance. And I like Brad using the word you want to give voice to others because giving voice is different to giving them the steering wheel or giving them the control. So, so you do want the voice. You want to have people making suggestions. And you want to do this not in a perfunctory way. You might want to listen to the suggestions. I give a number of examples in the book of some initiatives from employees that got implemented. But you need to also recognize that any one party is going to have a limited perspective. So let's say you ask your workers about the night tube in London, but they will just look at perhaps the negatives for work as it's going to lead to some antisocial hours. They might not think about the positives, which is the effect it's going to have on um, re re reducing drunk driving, allowing people to come home safely. And some if you only talk to customers, they might say, well, let's have the night tube every day. They not, might not recognize the, um, the, the impact it's going to have on people's lives. So I think the role of a, of a great CEO is that she needs to ask the, the different constituencies, but then because she's got the biggest perspective, is then to balance all of that. So you want to hear the, the, the different people's voice, but recognize that you might be, um, your unique position is that you can see the big picture and you're able to, to make some decisions that, 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 um, that others with, smaller, with, with a more narrow focus might not be able to do. Thank you very, very much. That, that's very persuasive. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, anybody else? <laughs> I see some questions out there. Got a question? Yep, yeah, Charlotte. Um, so thank you, Alex, for all of that. It was really interesting. Um, so I guess I have a bit of a question about pie growing. Oh. Um, and I think it's a problem we'd probably like to have. So here, here's the thought. When one company 
using ethicality grows their pie are they growing it at another company's expense there's only so many good people to employ there's only so many customers if all companies adopted ethicality would be for to find that we've got empty pies there's not enough cherries or apples or whatever to put inside them we've got big empty pie cases i'm just curious <coughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Charlotte. And I think what I need to emphasise, which I, I might not have done enough in the webinar, is actually what do I mean by the pie? The pie is not the size of the company, it's social value. So growing the pie doesn't mean growing the firm and becoming bigger. Um, social value is only created when you employ resources and they create more value in your company than they would do elsewhere, right? So every time we're going to use workers, as you're saying, Charlotte, we're taking, we're, we're depriving another company from using them. And just one stark, but, but also sad example is in Japan. There are many employees there who used to make magnetic tape. They don't have jobs anymore because magnetic tape isn't used. But rather than making them redundant, what they're doing is they've got banishment rooms in Japan is what they're known as, where you just keep um, the workers in these rooms because there's a taboo against redundancies and they do uh, sort of tasks such as reviewing security footage. So that doesn't create value for society. It doesn't also lead to human dignity. But by saying, oh, we're ethical, we're not firing anybody, that seems to be the idea of growth. But I'm defining growth quite differently, which is you only are growing the pie and creating social value if indeed you're um, creating value with the resources that you hire and so that's I think the, the big challenge so it does mean that right now um, in the pandemic some companies are making some tough decisions so like Airbnb they chose to make some workers redundant and that is I believe a pie growing idea why just the travel industry is going to be permanently downsizing after the pandemic but what is the role of a responsible leader is to make sure that when tough decisions need to be taken that you the company share the burden of the pain. So what they're doing is, well, they're saying in some places, I think like um, the US, it might be that it's two weeks of severance pay that you need to give. They're giving 14 weeks minimum worldwide. They're saying we're going to keep the health care of all of our workers for one year because we're in a pandemic. We want to make sure they have that. And they're also saying, well, what is most important for you is your laptop because that's going to help you have a new find a new job and we're going to allow everybody to keep the laptop so i think those are ways in which we can recognize that growing the pie does involve tough decisions but also make those tough decisions in an ethical way thanks very much thanks, great uh i have a question if that's okay go for it yes go ahead emma thanks um, thank you so i really enjoyed that alex that was a great talk thank you I was just wondering what you think kind of the role of regulation or government might be in this area. So I was wondering whether the view is supposed to be that unethical firms will eventually just die out because they're less profitable than other firms, or whether you think that government needs to take a more active role in convincing companies that don't see the benefits of being ethical, that that's the way to go. Thanks, Emma. I do think there is a role for governments and a major one, because why my talk was highlighting that we want to leave things to companies to some extent. Why? Because you can't legislate innovation. We want companies to adopt this. But I'm not a complete free marketer because I recognize that markets fail. And, and chapter 10 in the book talks about the role of governments. But let me just summarize this. Like, I think there's at least three sources of market failure. And one is externalities. So externalities are when you have an impact on wider society that doesn't ultimately affect you. Now, what I suggested with some of the evidence is that many things that we think of as externalities actually do help you in the long term. So if you invest in your workers, you actually are benefiting. But it would be too naive and overly simplistic for me to think that everything you do to affect society ultimately hits you. Because like the tobacco industry, right, the first evidence linking smoking to cancer was published in 1950. But 70 years later, we still have tobacco companies making outsized profits. So, so here the market failure is there could be certain actions that you're doing to harm society. Well, how do you address that? One is you've got to outright ban some of these activities or, or apply high taxes to that to try to get you to consider the externality, for example, carbon emissions. So one is externalities. The second is lack of competition. Right, so another reason why tobacco might be really profitable is that there, there's, there's a lot of concentration there. Um, 
as Emma was suggesting in a question, well, maybe if a company is unethical, then there might be the market will work out, maybe employees will leave an unethical company, but that requires there to be markets, and if there's no alternative company to go to, that's a problem. And the third reason why markets fail is just lack of information. So maybe as a customer, you might like to walk away from companies that are polluting the environment, but if it's not mandatory for companies to disclose their carbon footprint or the gender pay gap or whatever, then you're not... Um, able to uh, do this. So why I like the solution of mandating information disclosure is you're still allowing customers to, to make the choice. It might be that for some, com some customers, actually, because they just can't afford an another company, they might choose traditional farming over organic farming. Even though we would think that organic farming is ethical, it's not up to me to decide because I don't know the budgetary constraints of everybody. But at least if they have the information, then they can make those decisions. And I think that's why a way in which we can make mar markets operate better. Does that answer your question, Emma? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. So I think Nick has yep, a Nick. question, but there might be others also. I think Nick's got a question. Yeah, I'm just sort of carrying on from what you were saying. Um, I'm interested in what you think the role of ethical funds is, because I think earlier in your presentation, you made the case that ethical companies outperform the market by about 3%. And therefore, does that mean that ethical funds outperform the market by 3%? Or does it mean that ethical funds don't select ethical companies? Ah, okay, thanks. Um, so what my evidence suggested was companies that treat their workers well do beat the market by 23 to 3.8%. But unfortunately, the evidence for an ethical funds is that they don't beat the market. They, they pretty much mark perform or if anything they slightly underperform and that's important because we need to be careful of the evidence so some of you might know that Hargreaves Lansdowne last year produced this um, email to all clients saying ethical funds beat the market study after study shows that but that's not actually true and that was an unethical presentation of the data and um, the concern there is actually these ethical funds have high fees and so that might be encouraging their customer to high fees project products so how is there that that discrepancy well, um, ethical funds might use the wrong criteria. So they might not just look at employee satisfaction, they might look at other factors. So um, in terms of pay, I've got an entire chapter on the book on pay, which is chapter five. For me, I'm not so much concerned about the level of pay, but the structure of pay, whether it's linked to the long term or the short term, because really being ethical is about having long horizons and some ethical funds don't actually care about the long term or the short term they might only care about the level the level is still important but they might forget about things like the horizon so some ethical funds don't actually look at the right dimensions which is why one of the reasons for writing the book is to go through all the evidence and show us that well actually for pay maybe the most important dimension is not the level but it's the structure so it's because some ethical funds are looking at the wrong dimensions that's why they might not be outperforming okay thank you Sorry, uh, I had a question. Uh, it's Tim Dixon, uh, University of Reading. Oh, yeah, Tim, we'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Okay, thank you. Um, I was really interested in your talk, Alex, and um, some really interesting examples, particularly the Kenyan one at the beginning. Um, and I'm just wondering whether there's sort of a danger that by trying to create an ethical outcome, we might be in danger of uh, creating an unethical outcome because there's quite a lot of evidence over the last few years to suggest that actually um, the MPs uh, uh, app and the financing app that was developed led to quite a lot of difficulties around uh, borrowing, predatory borrowing and also gambling, online gambling. So by opening up a kind of unregulated market we could well be in danger of creating unethical outcomes. So I just wondered what your take on that was. I think this is, this is also a really good challenge. I think this is this always going to be the case with some innovation. Is some integration creates a, a lot of good, but then if, if there's not enough regulatory oversight, which goes back to Emma's question on the role of governments, then it could be harnessed for bad. So if you think about something like um, 
Google, right? So that created, that's made it loads of our lives easier because it's allowed us search and so forth. But if the algorithms are biased and that's problematic, something with Facebook that allows a lot of connectivity, but if again, it leads to an echo chamber that leads to some fake news being promoted, that's also negative. So um, I think you're right is that, yeah, when effort, when MPs got launched the first seven years, it was great. Now indeed there's some issues. And so this work might be where regulation needs to step in or maybe actually Vodafone needs to not think, oh, we've created this great thing. We need to now take responsibility seriously, just as the tech companies in the US are finally, I think many years too late, but I think they're finally recognizing that they do have this wider responsibility. So our fund, so I serve on the um, Responsible Investment Advisory Committee for Royal London Asset Management. We have five sustainable funds. And when I joined this committee about three years ago, we used to be always positive on, on tech. And now we're much more neutral on it because we're realizing that that tech can be used for some negative outcomes, just like maybe um, M-Pesa has now has something different from what it's um, what it originally intended. And if companies don't actually take up with the times and are not cognizant of their latest challenges, then indeed some investors might walk away. Indeed, at our at Royal London, we are not as positive about tech as an industry as we used to be. Okay, thank you. Thank We've you. got time for just a quick one from Anthony. Yes, I'm uh, on the court for the Mercer's Company, which is a philanthropic organisation. And one of the things that we are very interested in is social investment. Now, I think that uh, what you've been saying effectively is that social investment should be actually everybody's business. Every company should be involved. And really, uh, do you have a steer for the Mercer's Company as to how perhaps they should progress that viewpoint? Um, yeah, so, so what we do within Royal London, and, and this is only one approach, this is not to say it's the, the only or the, the correct approach, is, is when we define um, social purpose or ethicality, we do what's called a net benefit analysis. So we ask, does the, is the, is the world a, does this company create a net benefit to society? And I think that's interesting because often like ethical investing when it was first introduced was about screening. So we would say certain industries were good, other industries were bad, we're not going to be investing in these bad industries. And that's a bit too binary. So it could be that you could ex exclude a company just because it's sort of in an undesirable industry or maybe it crosses some red lines. So maybe in the US, there's some investors who say, if the CEO is the same as the chairman, that's bad governance and therefore we're going to um, not invest in it. So what this net benefit analysis does is it looks at it holistically. Yes, there's some companies which do a lot of bad, but also we're going to try to think about how much good that they create. And so to Tim's last question, we're going to think about, well, does MPs still create value if we were to balance the financial inclusion aspects with the negative aspects of, of potentially gambling and, and, and so forth? And now there is no um, sort of easy way to judge that net benefit calculation. It's going to be subjective. And there's some investors who say, well, therefore it's unworkable. If there's no clear way to put this into practice, then we don't know how to do this. But I think that's wrong, right? Let's say there was a clear way of deciding whether a company was ethical. We'd all be out of a job. Why? Because if there's a clear way to do this, we can just outsource that to artificial intelligence, right? Right now, we already have computerized funds that are investing on the behalf, on basis of things like profits and dividends and market shares and all the things that finance professors talk about. Whereas if you think about whether a company is ethical and creates value for society, right, that's something which is inherently subjective. It's something that computers can't get right. And so I think that that's the potential for some human judgment. And so let me just give one tricky example with, um, with, with one company that we, we held at Royal London Asset Management. And this is an alcohol company, Diageo. So we actually exited from it recently, but only because of valuations. So there's many people who think, well, how can you be an ethical company and have Diageo? Like, alcohol is really bad for you. But we actually don't screen out alcohol. We screen out tobacco and, and weapons. There's certain industries that we do screen out. But if we were to say we would never invest in an alcohol company, that would be just like saying alcohol is no net benefit to society. The world would be a better place if we just got rid of the alcohol industry. 
And I don't believe that. I think that alcohol does have a place, is that it can be a social lubricant in a world which is increasingly fragmented. It has a positive benefit. If you have a full day of a conference and there's a cocktail reception in the evening, I think that does encourage some social interaction. Now, obviously, there's a lot of downsides. And so when we looked at Diageo, we said, well, what their movement towards responsible drinking was very good. The carbon and the water usage was best in class and all of those other things. And so you would disagree with me. You might say, well, regardless of all that, alcohol is just so bad we should never invest in it. We would say we don't think the world would be better off with, with prohibition. There is a role for investing in the best in class company within an industry and trying to encourage other companies in the industry to, to adopt the similar practices by heralding this company as the one that people should go look, look at in terms of water usage and responsible drinking. Okay, and I see there's a couple of other questions which um, people, um, um, uh, which I might not have time for. So I'd be really happy to, um, to, to, to answer them on, on LinkedIn. So I guarantee uh, I'm going to answer any questions that I've got. Um, Daniel, if you um, either just drop me a message on LinkedIn, so I have your email address, or you can email me myself, then I will gladly answer your questions. And, and sometimes people might have questions which don't come up immediately after the fact. Drop me an, an email or drop me a link and message. I'd be really happy to, to do so. But let Thanks me just Alex, uh, hand back do that. to Tokyo. Yep. Superb. Well, thank you very much, Alex. That was a, exceptional. Um, please join me <laughs> in thanking Alex for a fabulous session. Um, so if you do have, as Alex was saying, if you do have any questions, um, you can continue to write the questions actually in the chat window. So we, we take a, a recording of that and we can pass those on to Alex and we'll get back to you with, with the responses as well. Or as Alex said, if you want to get back to him in terms of um, uh, LinkedIn or in terms of email, that's fine as well. Thanks, and Gilford, if, if there are questions in the chat, if, if people are willing to put their email address and I can reply to that, because I think with GDPR, you're not allowed to give me the email addresses unless they've consented right. to, to, to it, so um, I'd be really happy to reply, but just wanted to make sure that I have the details. So Brilliant. thank you so much again to everybody for, for, for attending and for setting this up, and uh, hopefully we can do this in person at some time soon. Like when, when, when Jill got in touch with me, and she said oh, it might be at the Modeski Stadium, and that I was like so excited about it. I was a season ago for many years there. But it's still great with the, the, the fact that we have technology that we're able to do this. So thank you so much. Sorry I have to duck out now just to uh, get on this uh, Fidelity call. Thank you, everybody. Brilliant. Thank Take you. care. All the best. All right. Thank um, you. If you Bye. would like to stay on, I just wanted to um, share my screen at this point in time. For a couple of minutes and we'll do, we'll do the wrap up. So fabulous session there. Um, as uh, Alex was saying, um, you can get a discount on the price, uh, and you've got. We'll share the we'll share the code afterwards um, with an email to you. Uh, but if you want to note it down now, if you want to um, get the book straight away, there is the code. Uh, we would uh, welcome. Uh, you joining us so we do have a whole bunch of things that are going on all the time if you go to our events page you'll see uh, a number of sessions that we've got um, organized over the next few weeks as I mentioned on the 9th we've got um, the reboot reading event and launch of our services um, component that would be fabulous if you could join us for that um, all our sessions including this one actually most of our sessions not all of them but most of our sessions are recorded and you can replay them. So if there are particular areas where you know you just want to refresh your memory, please go to that. Um, and um, please join us. Um, you can become a member, it's free, there's no cost, uh, and you can follow us on social media. So um, with that, um, I want to say a final thank you to our partners and supporters um, uh, that help us do uh, and uh, provide the funds and resources um, for doing what we do. So thank you very much for joining uh, the session and we look forward to seeing you again. All the best.